So good morning uh, all of you. Uh, so now that uh, quiz 1 is over, uh, I am sure that many of you are feeling a little bit familiar to whatever we have covered uh, until now. So the, that was on external boundary layer flows, external laminar boundary layers. So from today onwards we will start uh, looking at internal flows, okay. Uh, internal laminar flows, internal flows are very important as far as uh, you know engineering heat transfer is concerned because most of the heat exchangers that you are looking at, uh, the tube in tube heat exchanger, shell in tube heat exchangers, so they are all uh, uh, having internal flows and how do you design these uh, heat exchanges once you know the corresponding uh, relationship between the Nusselt number and uh, the flow conditions such as given by the Reynolds number as well as the properties given by a Prandtl number. So you have to develop uh, suitable correlations between uh, linking the heat transfer coefficient and the flow and the properties in some manner. So we will look at uh, developing such kind of correlations for internal flows. So far we had uh, developed these correlations for external flows. Uh, the technique for uh, internal flows are a little bit different, not uh, exactly like the way we are going to do uh, external flows where we had a clear boundary layer kind of a flow pattern. So we were giving boundary conditions like uh, at y equal to 0 you have uh, whatever uh, temperature and away from the wall you are giving free stream condition that is y going to infinity far away you are giving the free stream condition but in the internal flows there is no classical boundary layer kind of a pattern that you can follow especially when uh, the flow is uh, developing uh, fully developed so there in those regions uh, you cannot uh, look at uh, uh, regions which are far away from the boundary layer because in the case of fully developed flow, de flow everything is boundary layer itself okay the, b the boundary layers from the, b the bottom wall the top wall of a channel can merge and they can everything will be a vis viscous region and the same way in a duct you can have boundary layer growing simultaneously from all the walls of the duct and uh, you cannot really go and identify a point where you can uh, look at potential application of potential flow and things like that. So therefore the solution procedure for the laminar internal flows are slightly different from uh, the external flows. So therefore we will uh, start looking at some basic aspects of internal flows before going into the mathematical theory of how to solve uh, the laminar internal flow heat transfer. I think most of you are familiar with uh, the basics of internal flows. Uh, from your fluid mechanics uh, classes and your earlier heat transfer class. So I am going to give an overview, very brief overview and uh, we will look at uh, basic fully developed uh, case first okay where we can get the solution for velocity profiles very easily okay and then we will slowly gradually go to the case where we have uh, heat transfer. So we will look at uh, different regions again. So first we will start with the simplest case that is uh, both hydrodynamically and thermally fully developed case okay. So, so before doing that let, let us let me give you some kind of an overview to laminar internal force convection. Okay, so classically I would like to illustrate uh, internal flow by means of uh, flow between two parallel plates or flow uh, you can take a sectional view of a duct and then uh, look at how the flow pattern is. So here when the flow is entering the inlet of the duct so you have a uniform velocity across the cross section and then you see a boundary layer growth from say the two walls of the duct like this and this growth keeps going on till a particular location which is at the center of the, uh, the, the duct diameter okay. So exactly at the center the two boundary layers will merge and uh, after that the, look, the region whatever you are looking here it is completely dominated by uh, viscous effects. So whereas at the inlet you have a very small region close to the plates where your viscous effects are important outside still the potential uh, inviscid flow theory is valid whereas 
once the two boundary layers merge in this particular region everything is viscous dominated okay now if you look at how the profiles are drawn somewhere at the inlet you can have a profile something like this Now as you keep going downstream, the gradient becomes better and better. So as you keep going downstream, the gradient becomes lesser and lesser here you have very high velocity gradients at the wall and uh, slowly it get, gets uh, smoother and smoother now once you reach this particular zone here both the boundary layers merge and the velocity profile becomes what is called a parabolic velocity profile okay so therefore looking at the different uh, regions here you can classify the flow uh, based on whether you are looking from the entrance till the region where both the boundary layers meet okay from the uh, entrance of the duct so this this region this length is called the hydrodynamic entrance length okay so you can use the notation l subscript h to indicate that this is a hydrodynamic entrance length we will also have a similar entrance length for uh, temperature profiles so after the two boundary layers meet now the velocity profile uh, looks similar wherever you go downstream so it, it all becomes parabolic velocity profile and uh, this region is called fully developed region so therefore you can classify the different regions of uh, laminar internal flow uh, so now you can look at this region as uh, entrance length region or entry length region or hydrodynamically developing region okay so therefore here you can see the boundary layers uh, thickness is a function of position now once it merges then everywhere it is viscous dominated and the velocity profile is invariant of the axial location all right and this becomes completely fully developed So this is the characteristic of uh, internal flows and uh, in order to really understand uh, how to calculate the uh, length, the hydrodynamic entrance length, there are some several uh, hand waving correlations, there is no exact rigorous theory to determine the entrance length, okay. Strictly speaking you have to solve the equation and uh, understand where the velocity profile becomes parabolic and becomes invariant okay so just to give a empirical thumb rule for laminar flows the non dimensional entry length uh, so this is non dimensionalized by the diameter if you have a duct or if you have a channel so this is the separation between the two plates of the channel okay so lh by d is roughly 0 0.05 times re based on the diameter of the duct okay so here the reynolds number for internal flows is defined based on so how do we what kind of characteristic velocity that we have to use 
that is the question. So the kind of an average because here you see even if you look at a fully developed case you have a profile which is a function of y okay so you do not have a fixed velocity value like in a case of external flow like a free stream velocity therefore so you can use what is called a mean velocity which we will define shortly okay so this is your mean velocity so if you replace this parabolic velocity profile with a constant profile everywhere across the cross section so this is referred to as the mean velocity so naturally how you have to define the mean velocity volume flow rate or the mass flow rate has to be constant okay so therefore the mass flow rate defined by this let us say rho into um into the area for a circular duct the area is pi into r r not square okay where r not is the diameter radius of the duct so this should be equal to the flow rate obtained with this particular profile parabolic profile so that is rho into u into now if you if you say area is equal to pi r not square my da will be equal to 2 pi r not d r not okay so i can average this integrate this over the entire cross sectional area okay so this will be 2 pi r not d r not correct so i i have to integrate from uh, so if i take the coordinate from the center my radius right from the center this is 0 and this is r not okay so i integrate my profile across the entire cross sectional area so that will be rho u into r not into dr not so this uh, this will give me the mass flow rate and this mass flow rate given by this profile should be identical to the mass flow rate if i replace this parabolic profile with a uniform velocity okay so from this i can define my mean velocity or the bulk velocity okay my pi cancels so this is uh, if if you look at incompressible flows my density is also constant so that therefore this will be 2 by r not square uh, so here my r not uh, so this, this is basically my r I'm sorry this is pi r square okay so this is, so this should be 2 by r not square integral 0 to r not u into r dr so this will be the definition of my mean velocity or what I call as bulk velocity in internal flows okay. So this will be used as a characteristic velocity to define my Reynolds number and it is also based on the diameter of the duct divided by the kinematic viscosity okay is it clear okay so this uh, this is the area of uh, at any location r okay so if you if you look at any location r so this will be the cross sectional area pi r square okay so this is what i am using it so if i look at any differential area that will be 2 pi r dr so i have to integrate it over the entire cross sectional area so that's why that's why i am doing this integral right here okay uh, now based on the reynolds number you can again classify now when I say that for laminar flows this is the relation to calculate my entry length. So how do I first determine whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. So once again I, I use the definition of Reynolds number to check if it satisfies a certain cutoff or a critical Reynolds number okay. So for typically duct flows or flow between uh, two plates the critical Reynolds number for transition to turbulence will be approximately. 2300 okay this is a once again an approximate value you know it need not exactly become turbulent at 2300 in fact if you maintain the walls of this channel to be extremely smooth it can remain laminar even as high as 7000 or 8000 okay so if the turbulent intensity at the inlet is so small that it cannot trigger early transition to turbulence and if the walls of the 
channels are very smooth, it can go as, as high as the critical value can be as high as 8000 or 9000, okay. So if you check your RED is less than RE critical, so this is an approximate thumb rule for classifying the flow as laminar, okay. And otherwise, you can look at either in a transition regime or in a turbulent regime, okay. As far as laminar flows are concerned, this is the uh, thumb rule for calculating the entry length, all right. And uh, for turbulent flows, interestingly what happens, uh, the entry length ceases to be a function of Reynolds number, okay. So the entry length non-dimensionalized comes out to be approximately some 10, okay. So imagine that uh, you have a Reynolds number of say uh, 3000, okay. If you classify that as a laminar flow, thinking that the flow is still streamlined enough to be classified as laminar, so there what should be the value of LH by D? 15, okay. Now in the case of uh, turbulent flows, if suppose the 3000 was now turbulent, the LH by D would be 10. So now you can infer that the entry length, entrance length for turbulent flows is actually smaller than the entrance length of laminar flows, okay. So the reason is uh, the turbulence promotes lot of intense mixing or diffusion of uh, flow. So the mixing takes place due to the gradients along the y direction. So there will be intense mixing and therefore the profile can reach a fully developed state much earlier in the turbulent case than in the laminar case, okay. So therefore the uh, entry lengths are much smaller in the case of turbulent flow than the laminar flow. So now the condition that you have to apply to determine that the flow is fully developed. Okay, now you can see from the shape of the velocity profile that if you plot this velocity profile somewhere downstream, they are going to all look very similar. So we have to introduce a mathematical criteria, okay. So what should be the mathematical criteria? Hmm? How, do you, how do I say that I am in a fully developed region? For example, yeah. So you look at the velocity profile. If the gradient with respect to the axial direction, this is my axial direction. X, this is my radial direction. If this is zero, so this clearly tells me that I am in the fully developed region. Okay. So this is the criteria as well as the flow is concerned. Okay. Now associated to the flow, we can also have heat transfer. Now in the case of heat transfer, suppose I take a case where I have Prandtl number greater than 1, okay. So I have a growth, suppose I apply either a uniform heat flux or a uniform temperature to the duct walls, so either I say Q walls. In either of this case, now associated to the boundary layer growth of the velocity profile, you can also have a thermal boundary layer growth. Now if my delta, Prandtl number is greater than 1, my delta T will be less than delta and therefore if you see the growth of the thermal boundary layer, it will be smaller than the velocity boundary layer growth and therefore the point where they merge also will be slightly downstream the, than the uh, hydrodynamic entry length. Okay, so somewhere they will be merging here. So this will be my delta T x. Now, so similar to the hydrodynamic entrance length, I can also define what is called as a thermal entry length, the point where the two thermal boundary layers merge. Okay, I can use the notation L subscript T. To, inter to say that the length corresponds to the thermal boundary layer. And if I draw the profiles, okay, so typically uh, if I draw a profile somewhere here,
So now the wall temperature is higher than your uh, bulk temperature or the temperature of the fluid inside. So it should it should look something like this, right? So the magnitude of your wall temperature will be higher than the magnitude of the temperature of the fluid at the center, correct? So this will be your temperature profile, T as a function of Y. So now uh, when you say that you have a hydrodynamically fully developed region and you have a hydrodynamic entry length, similar to that you have a thermal entry length, okay? And you should also have a thermally fully developed region, okay? Just analogous to your velocity profiles where the velocity profiles are invariant of the axial location. However, you can very clearly see when you apply heat transfer, okay? The, the, for example, if you apply a uniform heat flux, what happens? The wall temperature keeps on changing with respect to X. The wall temperature will not be the same for example at the entrance and somewhere downstream because you are continuously adding heat. So therefore due to conduction so the wall temperature has to keep increasing downstream and also consequently the fluid also keeps getting heat continuously. So the fluid temperature also has to vary along the X. So therefore unlike the velocity profile which shows a constant behavior the temperature will never be a constant value, correct? So you will find the temperature of the fluid anywhere that you plot will keep on changing with respect to X at any Y location or even at the wall that also keeps changing. So how do we now look at a region and tell that that region corresponds to thermally fully developed, okay? So the criteria is we have to now uh, develop a definition to call a thermally fully developed region, okay? So how do we now use that criteria, okay? So thermally fully developed. So I know that due to heat transfer, my wall temperature is a function of X, it keeps changing. My fluid temperature anywhere is also a function of both X and R. Okay, now I have to same way similar to the way that I have defined what is called a mean velocity. Now I have to define another velocity which is something similar to a free stream velocity in external flow for internal flows. Okay, so I will define what is called as a mean temperature. So I need all of this to define a non-dimensional temperature, correct? So I need to define another mean temperature. Now this mean temperature should be a function of only X. So therefore it has to be constant again something like this, right? So this should be my mean temperature. The same way I define my uh, mean velocity based on continuity principle. I have to define the mean temperature based on what? Energy conservation. So what I should say is that the enthalpy of this uniform temperature profile should be the same as the enthalpy of the actual profile that, that you are getting, okay? So how do you now define enthalpy based on the temperature Cp T? Now this is the specific heat capacity. So the total enthalpy will be, you have to multiply by the mass flow rate. Now this is the, this is the average enthalpy if you replace the temperature profile with the uniform profile, correct? Now that should be equal to the enthalpy of this varying profile. How do you how do you calculate the enthalpy of that? Hmm? Integral 0 to R naught. So Cp, my m dot now will be, now there is a velocity profile also here. Please remember corresponding to this temperature profile there is a parabolic velocity profile. So my m dot there will be rho u into you have already dA which is your 2 pi 
into r dr okay and of course you have your temperature in, in, in the into the enthalpy so this will this will be t into r dr so so this is the balance of enthalpy you no know? so this is satisfying enthalpy conservation okay so therefore for an incompressible flow with constant property you can so this is nothing but your um, okay so let me just write it right now so i can knock off this and my tm will be 2 pi integral 0 to r not uh, i can take my rho out so t into u into r dr divided by so my flow rate there again will be a parabolic velocity profile so i can uh, write this as integral 0 to r not uh, into u into r dr right Uh, so I will have a 2 pi into rho again so this will get cancelled off so therefore this will be 0 to r naught you have t into uh, u into r dr divided by integral 0 to r naught u into r dr. So this is my definition of my mean temperature at any axial location, mean temperature or sometimes people refer to this as bulk temperature, sometimes they also refer to this as mixing cup temperature. So there are different names uh, to the same mean temperature. So so this mean temperature is defined based on the enthalpy conservation the enthalpy if you replace your uh, varying temperature profile with the uniform temperature profile okay so therefore now we can see that we have defined all our necessary temperatures here so you have t wall which is a function of x tm which is a function of x and you have t and therefore we can define a non dimensional temperature theta just similar to the external flows where we defined as t minus t wall by t infinity minus t wall we can define t minus t wall so t is a function of both x and r divided by t mean minus t wall okay so once you define a non dimensional temperature profile like this now we can look at a region where this non dimensional pro temperature profile is invariant of x because in that region your t minus t wall will be a particular function of x tm minus t wall will be a particular function of x such that the numerator and denominator are vary in the same way so, so therefore there will not be any variation of theta with respect to x so the condition for defining thermally fully developed flows will be d theta by dx should be equal to 0 okay so once i identify that region where my d theta by dx is equal to 0 so then i can call that this is a thermally fully developed region So I have to monitor my temperature profile theta non dimensional so if I plot the non dimensional profile so although the dimensional profile will be something like this okay the non dimensional profile will be something similar to the velocity profile okay so at wall it will become 0 right at the center it will be T me okay so therefore it becomes so so it so it will be something like this okay so you have this is your dimensional profile and this is your non dimensional profile this is your theta and this is your 
Now, once you plot theta, okay, so this theta should be only a function of r now in the thermally fully developed region because it does not, the non dimensional temperature profile now should not vary with respect to x. That is the condition uh, which satisfies the thermally fully developed region, okay. So, this should be a function of only r. Now, based on this, we can now define a criteria uh, for the heat transfer coefficient in the fully developed region, okay. So, therefore, in the thermally fully developed region, my theta is a function of r only. Whereas in the developing thermally developing region here, thermal entrance length region, my theta is a function of both x and r. Okay, but once it becomes thermally fully developed, it doesn't become a function of r x. It is a function of only r, provided your velocity hydrodynamically is fully developed. Okay, so this is a condition provided you are hydrodynamically also fully developed. Okay, so it should be hydrodynamically fully developed first, and that's that's where we have taken a variation like this. We have a parabolic velocity profile, and on top of it, if you if, if you put a condition that d theta by dx is equal to zero, so then you are looking at a location where your theta is a function of only r. Okay, so for, for this particular region, uh, you can calculate your heat transfer coefficient as minus k dt by, uh, so now it is not y anymore, it is r and uh, this will be at r equal to r, the heat flux should, wall heat flux should be at r equal to r naught, okay. Now you have to be careful with the sign because the coordinate is going from the center, it is not coming from the wall, okay. So therefore, you see the temperature profile, the temperature profile increases, the temperature increases with increasing r. So you do not have to put this negative sign here, the gradient will be anyway positive, okay. So whereas if you have a coordinate from like this, then the gradient will be negative, so you have to put a negative sign, okay. So now your coordinate system is from the center of the duct, so therefore you can just say this is k dt by dr at r equal to r naught divided by p wall minus p mean. This is how you define your heat transfer coefficient for internal flows, okay. So now uh, we can write this in terms of the non-dimensional temperature. So I can write this as d by dr. Since this is a derivative with respect to r and t wall and t, t mean they are functions of only x, okay. So they can be directly taken inside this and you can also uh, uh, introduce uh, t minus uh, yeah so t minus t wall by t m minus t wall and you can put a negative sign here. I'm just flipping this as t minus t wall. Okay, so since t wall t m they are only functions of x, I can just introduce this as t minus t wall by t m minus t wall, which is the same as this. Correct. So this is nothing but theta. So this will be minus k d theta by dr. Now this is at r equal to r naught. Now if you look carefully, my theta is a function of only r. Okay. So therefore, the slope of the profile at r equal to r naught that is the slope at the wall. So that also has to be a function of only that that is a fixed value. The slope at any point will be a function of r at the at the wall that will be a fixed value it can, now since theta is not a function of x so the slope also cannot be a function of x okay so whatever slope i calculate uh, with respect to the profile whether it is here or if i use the non dimensional theta so the slope i calculate will be the same because the profile is going to be the same the slope here and here they have to be identical so therefore, so this 
d theta by dr at r equal to r naught has to be a constant value. So which tells me that my h is a constant so therefore it is not a function of x. So this is a very very important conclusion. So as far as laminar internal flows both hydrodynamically and thermally fully developed so your heat transfer coefficient will become a constant it is not a function of x so that is going to simplify your uh, correlations very drastically okay so this is a very important principle and this does not depend on the boundary condition that you employ whether it is a constant wall temperature or constant heat flux irrespective of that we have not used any boundary conditions here irrespective of the boundary condition this is the fact that your heat transfer coefficient is a constant for laminar internally fully developed flows okay so so with that uh, this kind of gives you a brief overview what we are planning to do and in this particular in the next uh, 9 hours or so we will focus on three regions so first we will look at what is called region 3 okay so let me identify this this is region 1 uh, right here where your velocity hydrodynamically is growing and also your thermal boundary layer is growing this is uh, your region 2 where your velocity hydrodynamically has developed but your thermal development is still underway okay now this is your region 3 where both the boundary layers have merged and both the hydrodynamic and thermal boundary layers are fully developed okay so therefore the first part of the course will be on region 3 which is uh, fully developed both hydrodynamically and thermal and as you can see that is the simplest to start with because you have constant heat transfer coefficient so you can calculate the velocity profile the temperature profile and for a given boundary condition whether it is a heat flux or a wall temperature you can identify what is that constant value of h okay so then slightly more complicated is region 2 where you have fully developed hydrodynamically and thermal entry length so here your velocity profile is fully developed profile but the equation that you are solving does not have that condition d theta by dx 0 okay and finally the most complicated region is region number 1 where you have both hydrodynamic and thermal entry length so this region you cannot get a good close form analytical solution you have to solve the complete Navier-Stokes equation because you cannot neglect any terms the gradient of velocity is not 0 the gradient of non dimensional temperature is not 0 so therefore all the terms in the navier stokes equation has to be present you cannot neglect any of the terms and therefore you have to do a complete numerical solution for the region 1 okay so in this particular uh, course we will be focusing on region 3 and then a uh, lot of uh, problems related to region 2. okay so we will stop here and uh, tomorrow we will look at uh, we will start of course with region 3 we will look at the solution to first the hydrodynamic fully developed condition get the velocity profiles and then the, depending on the thermal boundary condition we will also get the fully developed temperature profiles.